all Tatars are to be exiled from the territory of Crimea. They are to be settled permanently as special settlers in regions of the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic. This is the text of resolution number 5859 SS signed on May 11th, 1944 by Joseph Stalin. Exactly one week later, on May 18th, the deportation of virtually every Crimean Tatar began. Almost 200,000 people were removed in only three days. As one historian has noted, to this day, it remains one of the most rapid and thorough cases of ethnic cleansing in the history of humanity. At gunpoint, Soviet authorities gave the Tatars one hour to vacate their homes. They were then stuffed into cattle cars. Many of you who are of Ukrainian background recognize the scenario. And this, of course, applies to so many other nationalities that fell under the boot of Soviet authorities. They were stuffed into cattle cars. The Soviets did, however, make allowance for the fact that these were people and not cows. They provided for a bathroom in each car, a hole in the middle of the floor. Not surprisingly, approximately 7,000 Tatars died during the three to four week trek to Uzbekistan. Tens of thousands more died during the first year of exile alone. Among the deportees during that fateful 1944 was an infant of several months. His name was Mustafa Jemilov. Mr. Jemilov recently provided a suggestive account of how the Tatar community in exile received the news of the death of their benefactor, Joseph Stalin. The death that occurred in 1953. And I want to cite this account because it contains an evocative image to which I shall return later. When Stalin died in 1953, Mr. Jemilov was in elementary school, obviously in exile. He writes that everyone at the school was crying, because again, those of us who know something about Soviet history know all too well. Everyone at the school was crying, except of course the Crimean Tatars. And Jemilov describes the scene thus, and I quote, At the news of Stalin's death, all the staff and students were sobbing as if it were the end of the world. I watched our school administrator weeping and thought, he must be pretending. My father had told me one thing about Stalin, yet this guy was crying like it really was the end of the world. The school administrator made a speech in front of the children. Continue quoting Mr. Jibinov. The school administrator told us that the great leader of all the people 
had died. He then stopped talking and began sobbing. And he then left the room. I figured he must be pretending, so I followed him into the empty classroom next door to see what was really going on, whether he was sincere. There I saw him actually beating his head against the wall as he continued to cry. Mr. Jemilov continues, but we, the Tatar students, we, we weren't crying. So a boy by the name of Reshat Bekmanbetov ran up to us and said, listen, everybody's crying. Only our people aren't crying. We could be thrown into jail for this. So I, Mustafa Jemilov, so I brought an onion and rubbed it under all of our eyes so that we too would be seen crying. Without the onion, there would have been no tears. End of quotation. Today, my brothers and sisters, as we reflect on the events of 1944, and just as importantly, on the events of the annexation of this past March, we should be asking ourselves, what will it take to stir our emotions? What will it take to move Western nations to tears, not artificially for a tyrant, not artificially for a tyrant, a despot, but sincerely, for a forgotten and misunderstood people. It seems that today we need more onions. We need the unpleasant sting of the whole truth. We need to irritate. We need to irritate Western authorities so that they would refute the lies concerning the Crimean Tatars and speak truth to power. And because we have gathered in this sacred place, this privileged space of God's presence, we need to recommit to the truth that resists human manipulation. We need, quite simply, to rediscover the category of the absolute, absolute principles, absolute truths, commandments that dare not be forgotten. Tragically, the contemporary philosopher Richard Rorty has proclaimed, truth is whatever you can get away with. And he was not being facetious. He was summarizing a postmodern mindset in which the absence of a transcendent referent inevitably causes the question of truth to be dismissed as an irritating hindrance on the way to problem solving. Or more accurately, an irritating hindrance to the power for which we humans so often lust. Several decades ago, the poet Viktor Nikitovov reflected on the plight of the Crimean Tatars and wrote, My thoughts cluster in rows of haggard emotions and powerless words. Of haggard emotions and powerless words. But as we reflect today on the plight of the Crimean Tatars, we need to admit the following. 
We need to admit that in the West, and certainly in other lands and territories and countries, we're actually capable of generating very powerful, very powerful, not powerless words. We have at our disposal technologies that saturate entire populations with messages that stir them to action. The only problem is that frequently it's the wrong messages and thus the wrong actions. Neil Postman, the brilliant media analyst, has studied how we today are amusing ourselves to death. That's actually the title of his classic analysis of the modern media culture. Amusing ourselves to death. And it struck me recently, if I might just add, that, add this parenthetically, especially in this context, in some circles, even funerals today have become a form of entertainment. But in spite of my somewhat dour critique of our present cultural crisis, which prevents us in newer ways, it prevents us in newer ways than before from going deeper to learn the truth. In spite of my, as I say, dour critique, allow me to add a note of celebration. A celebration of the fact that today's memorial, and especially the launch of the book, This Blessed Land, really do serve to put a big dent in the big lie. And I do so, I do so with profound personal gratitude. You see, I had always presumed that as a son of Ukrainian immigrants, I possessed at least some sense of the true history of another misunderstood people, the Crimean Tatars. I had even met General Petro Hryhorenko back in the 1980s and heard him speak on two occasions. But it was only as I read through the book, This Blessed Land, and did some additional reading, that I realized the extent of my own ignorance and even latent bias. And so the facts, the facts which cannot be repeated often enough are the following. For those of us like me who think or thought that they really had a grasp of this history, these facts are the following. By 1944, by May of 1944, most of the 20,000 Crimean Tatars that had served in German military units had retreated to Germany. The majority of Crimean Tatar young men remaining in the USSR were Red Army soldiers fighting against the Nazis. And much of the Crimean Tatar population remaining in Crimea in May 1944 were women and children. The Soviet government did not merely send suspected German collaborators and their families into exile. Instead, the Soviet government deported innocent women, children, invalids, Red Army veterans, Communist Party and Komsomol members without exception. And why? Because the Soviet government was interested in controlling Crimea as part of a hoped-for expansion into Turkey. It's as simple as that. We have gathered today to remember, to remember tens of thousands of people who belong to a distinct 
disposable nation. As Stalin said, no people, no problem. Ironically, however, even in our information age, most Westerners have not only forgotten the Crimean Tatars, most Westerners have never even known about them to begin with. But we do not lose hope. We are not dejected. We are not forlorn. For we stand before the one who never forgets and for whom no life, no life is disposable from conception to natural death. 